Good afternoon. As we wait for more people to connect today, I wanted to thank you for joining us for a timely discussion on Israel's election results this week. I'm Rachel Rosen. I'm the Communications Director for DMFI. On behalf of our President, Mark Melman, our Board of Co-Chairs, and Lewis and Todd Richmond, who are with us today, and our entire staff, welcome. We really appreciate your spending time with us on a, on a Thursday afternoon. In just a minute, I'm going to turn it over to our Board Co-Chair, Ann Lewis, to introduce our distinguished guests today. But first, I wanted to go over a couple of housekeeping items. If you like what you're hearing today, please consider following us on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, you name it. You can sign up for our news and updates on events like today's at our website, dmfi.org. And if you'd like to ask a question today, please type it into the Q&A feature if you're joining us on Zoom. Or if you're on Facebook, you can type it into the comment section. And with that, I'm very pleased to turn it over to our board co-chair, Ann Lewis. Ann? Thank you, Rachel. Well, as we know, on Tuesday, Israel held its fifth election in four years. Now the results are in. And we're wondering about the impact. What does it mean for the Israeli political landscape and the U.S.-Israel relationship? I'm so pleased to introduce our panel because these are three highly respected experts I've been listening to and learning from for years. Cal Schneider is the political correspondent for Times of Israel. She covers politics and foreign affairs. Tal was previously the DC correspondent for Marib Daily. She's been a political blogger and the political correspondent for Israel's Globes newspaper. She's also a frequent commentator on Israel radio and TV stations. Lahav Harkov is the senior contributing editor and diplomatic correspondent for the Jerusalem Post. Lahav reports on and analyzes Israel's relations with the world, with the Prime Minister's Office, the National Security Council, and the Foreign Ministry. She has interviewed major figures across Israel's political spectrum and is frequently connected to the country's top lawmakers and diplomats. And David Makovsky, the Ziegler Distinguished Fellow at the Washington Institute for New Year East Policy, Director of the current Project on Arab-Israel Relations. David has worked in the office of the U.S. Secretary of State, served as a senior advisor to the Special Envoy for Israeli-Palestinian Negotiations, and is co-author with Ambassador Dennis Ross of the book, Be Strong and of Good Courage, How Israel's Most Important Leaders Shaped Its Destiny. David also hosts the podcast, Decision Points. So welcome and thank you all. Now, Rachel is going to moderate this program, but as long as I have the microphone, I get to ask the first question. So Tal, give us the state of play. Where are we now? Hi, thank you, Anne. Thank you for the lovely introduction. And I'm, I'm very pleased and uh, I'm happy to be here with all of you. Um, where are we now? Just uh, really before we enter this Zoom conversation, the Central Election Committee finalized, finalized the tally, you know, finalized all the votes. And uh, as we don't have the formal announcement yet, we know the numbers, uh, the total numbers. And we also have the Prime Minister Lapid, uh, may I say the outgoing Prime Minister, calling up Netanyahu and congratulating him for his uh, success and victory, saying he will uh, have all of the, um, you know, due due process of, of transfer of powers and uh, that he instructed all of the government's officials to transfer powers and uh, that's it. I mean, we, we will have probably um, a new prime minister within, you know, weeks. They, we expect a very fast uh, um, negotiation, even though with Netanyahu, you know, it's, uh, it has proven us uh, that he always takes the time. But he will definitely be granted with the mandate to form a government, I suppose, from the president next week or in a, 10 days. And then he will negotiate. But we already know the negotiation has started. The bloc, the Netanyahu bloc, now has 64. The reason for our political crisis in the last three and a half years and a fifth election cycle was that the Netanyahu bloc never reached beyond uh, 60. You know, the Knesset has 120. You need to have half plus one, that's 61. So in all of the election cycles before that, the Netanyahu bloc has reached between 55 and 60. They were expecting 
60-60 result or even a 61-59 result, which would you know, enable Netanyahu to form a government. So those were the expectations for many months. But uh, the, on the election uh, day, it became clear that two parties from Israel's uh, you know, Arab uh, community and Israel's left merits did not cross the threshold. So the, the political map obviously veered to the right and Netanyahu has 64 bloc that can, you know, um, can grant him a stable government for at least four years, I guess. So um, I will, you know, this is the, where we at at the moment. Thank you so much, Tal. And Lahav, I, I wanted to see if you had anything to add to that, but also clearly this is a big victory for former Prime Minister Netanyahu. At the same time, voters were really almost evenly divided in their support for him. So how do these facts fit together? Yeah, so I, you know, Tal talked about the, the there were two parties that didn't pass the electoral threshold, which is 3.25% in Israel. Um, when you look at the actual number of votes of the pro-Netanyahu bloc and the anti-Netanyahu bloc, um, and, and this is including parties that had representation in the previous Knesset but, but didn't make the threshold, they're almost even. And the right leads by 30,000 votes, but 30,000 is not that many in a country of 10 million people. Um, so, you know, people, people were complaining that basically the left lost on a, on a technicality. And I, I think that Democrats in the US are familiar with the feeling of losing a technicality. Um, so there, there's a lot of that sort of frustration going on, uh, but in the end, this is this is the system, and this has been the system for uh, of calculating the votes for like 50 years now. The, the threshold was raised more recently, um, so that's just sort of something to note that it, it's on the one hand, Netanyahu has he won big, you know, 64 seats is, is a solid victory in any year, not just after five elections practically in a row. Um, but on the other hand, it's not like there was a well, Likud is blue, so it's not like there was a blue wave in Israel. Thanks, Lahav. David, can you jump in and give us your, your assessment as well? Uh, I, look, it's, it's basically everyone, I think we all agree that there was no like Likud wave uh, in, in a sense. I mean, in terms of like, I think Likud started at 35 seats, uh, ended, you know, less than that. Uh, and, you know, in American terms, you, you know, we expect the party to get half the vote, but Israel is a multi-party election. Uh, and so the Likud didn't outperform, but where its strength was, was its ability to kind of integrate, I think, the, the different parts of its coalition. And Netanyahu is known as very effective on this, is he forced certain compromises among, like, within the hard right. Um, that that was key for him. He was because he didn't have any parties on the bubble, like and the other center left had four parties on the bubble, you know, and and when two didn't make it, that uh, well, well, one in particular merits that was a real defeat. Uh, Balad was not expected to make it, but the the loss of those four seats, you know, just went down the drain, and it, and it seems that the Likud was very strategic down to the down to the minutia of getting Ayelet Shaked to stay in the race, not to come out of the race, because it wanted to drive up the threshold numbers, because they knew that, that there were a few parties on the center left that were very close. So having her in was actually to their advantage, not to their disadvantage. But I think the analytical point beyond the, the, the threshold issues and uh, the ability of the right to uh, BB personally to kind of drive home those those four parties that have been with him um, is the role of violence uh, in this uh, election. I think that is something that for a lot of our you know viewers on this Zoom it might it might not be something that they're familiar with, but the fact is is that it's an iron law in Israel. Basically, the violence drives people to the right. I mean the the Bennett coalition, which was the most diverse government in probably in Israel's history. You think of it like a football field, you know, end zone to end zone almost, uh, with the Arab parties as well, that 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 the diversity had, we were looking at polling data that people even thought was a good thing that Arabs were part of the government. Uh, but I think what happened was that 
Ramadan, when the, when the 19 Israelis were killed in April, all of a sudden we saw the numbers go the opposite way. And that uh, people, that the parliamentarians, a woman named Edith Solman, there was another fellow Orbach, that they lost their bare majority. And I think one of my takeaways from all this is that the public likes the idea of maybe the Arabs in a government, but they don't necessarily think that they should have the decisive 61st vote. And if it would have been a, a wider government where their vote wasn't decisive, I think it would not have created the backlash in certain areas. You had the raw sense of the violence of 2021 from the inter, uh, the, the mixed city riots that were still raw in people's minds. So I, I think what happens is that violence creates a sense of defiance and that defiance moves people to the right. And even though I think this government was very tough as nails on the violence, as the other, the, the Netanyahu party, it could, and some others, and certainly Ben Veer and others, really drove home a certain, I thought, a very unfair perception of their actions. And that somehow stuck with a certain uh, majority, but it, but it still did produce a wave. It still, we would have had almost half and half but the combination of the violence and the two parties falling behind the bubble, under the bubble, uh, you know, I think that combination proved to be deadly, I'm sorry to say, politically uh, for the center left. Thanks, David. And, and Tal and Lahav, I wanted to ask you some part of the, the same uh, piece that, uh, that uh, David touched on. Is that what is that what we heard directly from Israeli voters, that security issues and some of the recent uh, violence uh, drove their vote to, to move to, to the right? Well, I, I, I would sort of expand on something that David touched on, um, specifically the rioting last year in May. You know, a synagogue was burnt down in Lod. Um, Jewish businesses were burnt down in Akko, um, and there were Jews who struck out and fought back, you know, against Arabs and things like that, and I'm not going to, I don't deny that, but um, I think the sense among a lot of Jewish people who lived in those cities and people who had relatives in those cities is that the police didn't show up on time, weren't effective, and that this was under Netanyahu, this was Netanyahu's last, like, week, or last couple weeks as prime minister um, last year. And, and that helped drive a lot of votes specifically to Ben Gvir because he was someone who sort of didn't let up and continue to talk about these issues and continue to go to those communities. Um, and, and I do think that the reason that the, the extreme right specifically um, doubled in size in this election was because of, of those fears specifically, maybe even more so than the terrorism in Jerusalem and things like that, because it's tragic, but it's also something that Israelis, it doesn't surprise Israelis, right? And the rioting inside the cities was something new that, that sort of no one or very few people expected. Um, I, I think the terrorism issue did come up in election campaigns. I was, I was actually surprised just sort of being on the ground in Israel that it didn't come up more. Um, because, um, you know, Netanyahu is known for campaigning on those things, um, you know, quite famously against Paris and, and back in the day and more recently as well. Um, but, but he didn't do it as much as I really, like, it just wasn't like really his focus, but it's still, you know, these are the stories that were coming in at the top of the news on TV every night. So it was still on people's minds. Thanks, Lahav. Tal, anything you wanted to add? Okay, great. Okay, well, I'm going to go to our. Okay, I'm going to go to our Q and A, and we're getting a lot of questions about well, how long could this Netanyahu run government last? Perhaps any anyone want to uh, make speculations or, or guesses on that? Yeah, I can. You know, I can say that I think it can go on. Uh, for uh, definitely more than a year. It's not going to be uh, this uh, unstable government. This uh, block of Netanyahu is much more organized and um, you know they have huge experience of working together for many years. So, I mean, the first Netanyahu government, not the first, the second Netanyahu government from 2009 and 2013, who was in power for four years, uh, it was basically the same components plus, plus uh, Hewitt Barak. 
but basically uh, Netanyahu has a good uh, working relationship with the, the ultra orthodox with the uh, religion Zionists. You know, obviously they replaced for the years, but they're all very, very loyal to him on the personal basis. Um, the only person who is new to the group is maybe the uh, chairman of um, one of the faction of United Torah Judaism, the uh, chairman of, um, of um, Aguda, Aguda. Uh, his name is Yitzhak uh, Kolknoff. He replaced uh, Litzman and um, he's a bit of a wild card for Netanyahu. It maybe doesn't, you know, oblige to him personally, but has no interest to 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 be the, the renegade. So I mean, he's going to be, you know, he's going to stick to the group. He, he wants to be the finance minister. This is what he was campaigning on. Netanyahu will have a bit of um, you know issues of delivering the the portfolios. But other than that, you know, once the portfolios are done and the government is sworn in, definitely first year is going to be you know effective and 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 um, organized uh, after after one budget usually you have some cracks but i don't expect nothing like the government we've seen in the last couple of years which were on the brink of falling apart at any minute so um you know after uh, three and a half years of this uh hustle back and forth this is a government that probably can work so I don't know for how long, but you know they can definitely they can definitely stay for four years if they will will do it right. I can just add that um, I, I agree with Tal that the there's a cohesiveness uh, with Bibi and the ultra orthodox. They've been ironclad since 2009. Uh, it's been incredible, and they and the ultra orthodox have really suffered for it because when they've been in the political opposition in the wilderness, you know they they stuck with him. So. I don't see a problem there. What I don't know are wild cards that I'm I'm not sure about. We don't have a real history of what does it mean with this religious Zionist having 14 or 15 seats. You know, they they're not institutionalists in the same way uh, uh, with uh, you know the way the ultra orthodox are. Ben Gvir is a is a wild person in in certain ways, and that. He, we don't know there could be some issue that he decides, no, this is the issue I'm going to fall on my sword on. In theory, it shouldn't be. In theory, it, it, it shouldn't uh, happen. Look, they got 64 seats. This is bigger. We've, we, we've just seen four elections. No one's had 64. So in theory, this sounds like a recipe for cohesiveness. But sometimes there are unknown unknowns, and you just don't know. We don't know if, if there's going to be a you know, what is going to be the impact of BB's trial? Uh, you'd say, well, there won't be an issue because they'll change the law. So it won't be an issue. Uh, I'll tell you one thing they won't have a problem on, and that is they don't have BB in the opposition. BB was willing to do things that if Lapid would have done what BB did uh, in the last government, imagine if, if Lapid had worked with Ahmed Tibi to stop. Uh, settler uh, regulations that were that are fi every five years they are extended where the, that they, the settlers come in the judicial system. Bibi had no compunctions to do that, um, and 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 he parliamentary wise he worked with TB at, at the extreme left in a way that Lapid just didn't have that. The, the, the media is just not, I'm not, not talking, our panels here are outstanding, but I'm saying the Israeli media and his public does not hold Bibi to the same standard that they hold uh, the center left. And he could do these parliamentary maneuvers that were destabilizing. I still think without the violence, the government would have stayed. But Bibi's prowess in, in the Knesset is, is, is formidable. And so I, he has the advantage that he doesn't have a Bibi on the other side, I, I think. But I just want to be a little cautious in saying, I know this is going to work for four years because there could be developments here that that we cannot foresee. But in theory, he's got good opening cards, 64 seats, very cohesive with the ultra-Orthodox, uh, you know, people that in theory have nowhere else to go in a certain way. The politicians of the ultra-Orthodox might want to go to the highest bidder, but their publics are very pro BB. And I've heard this from them, you know, like we don't have room to maneuver like regular people, you know, we just don't because our public is in a certain way. Maybe Degelator a little bit different, but certainly Shas and others. I, I think he's got good opening cards, but it's the Middle East. Never say never. 
and don't be so sure that something's going to last for four years. Most Israeli um, governments don't last. Bibi, you know, in the past has always wanted a party not from the right to join him. Uh, Ehud Barak in 2009. 2013, it was kind of imposed on him uh, in a certain way. It wasn't typical. But I think that his, if he could expand the coalition to bring Gantz in, uh, the defense minister, I think he would like to, because every prime minister, no one wants to be held by the throat by a few members of Knesset. They all want the extra breathing room. Well, if you get 64, but imagine if I get 12 more, that's uh, 76. So they all want to expand. But whether it's possible might depend on developments with what are they going to do on the courts? Are they going to try to change the laws? You know, that right now I don't see Gantz joining. And I, but I, I wouldn't rule out that he tries to expand. Uh, I think that's his MO. And I think uh, I, I, I wouldn't rule it out. So he's got good opening cards, but there are wild cards out there that make me think that don't say for sure he's locked in for four years. Thanks, David. And Lahav, maybe you can expand on that a little bit uh, uh, with this question uh, from Lisa. Do you see any prospect of BB going for a broader unity style coalition rather than creating a far right coalition with Ben Kvir and Smotrich? His comments about not bowing, notwithstanding. So, I mean, he made those comments about not bowing, right? Basically, when asked about um, Senator Menendez and I represent Sherman from California who had made comments about, you know, um, having Ben Gvir in the cabinet will hurt the US-Israel relationship. Um, but he also on election night in his sort of victory speech talked about trying to be a more uniting figure, not going on, he said unnecessary adventures, you know, like governing conservatively. Um, if I think that if Netanyahu could if he could get away with it, he would prefer not to have Itamar ben Gvir in his government because as, as David called him, he's a, he's a wild card. He's a provocateur. He's not someone who anyone knows if he's able to work in a serious way, <laughs> sit in a cabinet meeting for three hours and you know, uh, really, really govern. Um, and, and Gantz is proven, at least in that capacity, even if he and Netanyahu don't agree, don't see eye to eye on a lot of things. Um, that being said, a coalition with Gantz, I don't think he can have both. Certainly not at this stage. Like, I agree with David on that. And so it would be one or the other. And Gantz has promised that he won't join an, a coalition with Netanyahu, which is a promise that he's broken in the past, but right now it doesn't look like he wants to break it. Um, and also the, the right-wing voter base right now um, felt really betrayed in the last election, in the 2021 election, that they voted for certain right-wing parties and then those parties helped form a coalition that was majority center to left-wing and included an Arab party, et cetera. And, and you can really see by, that they punished those parties um, in the way that they voted. And so there's also like a political question of whether Netanyahu thinks that he can, um, can do that the way the base feels right now. I think um, because it looks like he's gonna be able to build a relatively stable government, he probably could get away with it. And also because as David had said, like BB can get away with things that other people can't, like just the, for the people who love him, like him so much that you know he can get away with things. Um, but I, I still think that it, it'll be a challenge and it's not very likely that he'll be able to form a coalition with Gantz at this stage. Thanks, Tal. I mean, thanks, Lahav. Tal, I know you were in uh, the U.S. recently. I believe you traveled with the Israeli president. And I wanted to get uh, your response to this question that, David, I'm going to go to you on this because you I know you recently wrote about it. Uh, Tal, Ed Edward asks... What kinds of problems can we anticipate in the U.S.-Israeli relationship if Ben Gvir is a minister in the government? And what leverage do Lapid and Gantz have? Yeah, actually, it's amazing. It was just last week. I mean, uh, we came back uh, on Thursday, exactly a week ago. Uh, we were uh, with Herzog on the ground for 36 hours because it's campaign season. Uh, Herzog was, you know, I think... Um, loaded with questions about the next government and he kept on saying, I don't know the results, I can't answer anything, I have no idea what's gonna happen. We, I ask you to respect the 
uh, democracy of the Israeli people. So yeah, um, you know, obviously Ben Gvir is a member in the Knesset for the last, uh, I think, two two years, if I maybe a year and a half. Um, you know, last uh, previous rounds, Netanyahu was negotiating to get Ben Gvir inside the, the other parties, and the the promise, the, the um, you know, he, he was asked in an interview, and Netanyahu was asked in an interview. Would you grant uh, Ben Gvir uh, uh, a ministry? And he said, No, no, no. He is not. Um, is well, he didn't say he's not eligible, but he said, you know, no, he's not going to be a minister. The it was it, we have a written agreement from from that year. I think it was 2020. We have a written agreement saying Ben Gvir is going to serve as the chairman of the Constitution Committee, a very important committee. That is the chairman of the Constitution Committee. Uh, now, I mean, when we saw the numbers growing and growing, uh, Ben Gvir was already campaigning uh, in, in, at least since August, saying, uh, "Okay, I'm I'm going to be the next uh, Homeland Security Minister. This is the minister who is responsible for the police. The sensitivity, of course, is in several parts. It's not just um, being um, the person in charge of uh, Israel's police force. It's also uh, border police, which is a very, very sensitive, sensitive uh, contention points all over the country. Uh, we do see some, um, you know, um, events unfolding with uh, border police policemen and and being being uh, shot and, and wounded and killed by by terrorists on the borders. Um, there is the very sensitive element of the Temple Mount. Uh, Temple Mount is on the table at every capital around the world. It's in D.C. It's in Cairo. It's in it's in uh, uh, Jordan. Uh, diplomats from uh, from neighboring countries, so Arab neighboring countries to Israel, have spoken to me, and I published that. So it's uh, it's out there. Uh, obviously, they spoke uh, without their names, saying we will have to cooperate with the minister on any riots that take take on Temple Mount, and it's going to be a huge problem for us. How can we? discuss this issue with him, you know, let me just, you know, explain. Ben Gvir is uh, being blamed for inciting violence on Temple Mount. And also he was convicted in eight charges of some of them inciting violence, some of them of um, um, assisting terror organization or identifying with this, all sorts of, uh, of clauses in the penal code. So it was, it was charged over 50 times, but convicted eight times only. Uh, and this is the person, well, I mean, he's been in a beef with the police for years. And this is the person who is going to be charged of the policeman. It's just, um, you know, the concept is mind blowing. Um, you know, what's gonna happen in DC? And, and in, you know, I, I, I don't know, it's, it's hard to expect. I know that uh, in previous years when the administration did not like Israel's ministers, such as foreign affairs minister at the time, Lieberman, uh, he was just, he was not invited to DC at all. I, I mean, I was, well, was I DC correspondent? I think I was DC correspondent. And then at the time, and, and uh, maybe I was just transferring to Israel at the time. And, and Lieberman definitely was not invited, not to the White House and not to the State Department at all for years. Um, so, but, that, but it goes beyond just inviting someone for cocktail parties in the seventh floor of the State Department. This is not about this. This is not about that. It's about, it's about um, diplomatic issues when, when you need to cooperate um, border patrols with other countries, neighboring countries. I mean, the relationship with Jordan between, you know, um, when Netanyahu was in power, the relationship uh, it, with the, the Jordanian king were not so good to begin with. And uh, the outgoing government, Lapid and Bennett uh, and Herzog actually did a lot of effort to fix the relationship. It went back to being, you know, in a better, um, more understanding and so. And uh, I don't think the Jordanian king is going to just break all relationship because Netanyahu is, is coming back in. That's not the case. They definitely he knows him for many years. But they're going to have, you know, difficulties with Temple Mount and with cooperation with him. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, seems, uh, it seems to me that Netanyahu knows that this is a problematic situation and he, he will have to come with some flexible arrangements. I don't know what, but yeah.
Thanks, Tal. D David, yeah. I'd love to get your take. Yeah. I know you you wrote an op-ed right. uh, that touched on this. Yeah. We're going to share your op-ed in the chat. Okay, thank you. Look, I I have to believe for what everything that Tal just said that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu was going to find a way not to make this guy the Homeland Security Minister. There's just it's fraught with so much. I would even go further than Tal. I think Tal was being generous in the way she depicted it. I mean, I would say the Temple Mount, Haram al-Sharif, whatever you want to call it, is probably the most flammable location in the entire Middle East, maybe in the world next to the Straits of Hormuz, you know, certainly in the Middle East. It is. And now that the guy who's going to be in charge of who goes up there on a daily basis, he's going to be seen as, I hate to use this phrase, uh, but almost like, you know, lighting matches, you know, like, and to see which one, when it's gonna take. Now the Israeli system, of course, there's other people besides the police minister, the Shin Bet, the army, you know, there's other people too. So it's not like he's the only guy, but he's a pivotal guy. And I just gotta believe that Netanyahu will understand that very quickly. He understands it now. And I think he'll have to come up with an alternative ministry for him. I don't know if it's gonna be transportation. He's probably, it sounds like he's got education for Smotrich which will create its own uh, issues, uh, but somewhere to keep them away from a security portfolio. I have to believe that. Look, I think it, what Tal said is accurate. I mean, I, people forget the United States basically boycotted Ariel Sharon for 15 years. The Israeli media doesn't write about this, but since the sovereign Shatila, they didn't deal with him basically almost till he was foreign minister in 1998, it was almost 16 years, but it was breaking up at the end. Um, so, I mean, I think whether they announce it as a, a formal boycott, they might not, they'll say we're under review, we're, we're, we're you know, they, you know, they can fudge it. But the result, I think, might be even more than with Lieberman. Uh, I think they might just basically see him as persona non grata in terms of being an interlocutor. So I, I think that's also something that Israel needs, you know, the BB is going to have to think about. I think this is a key time. It's no one wanted to talk about this publicly. I know there were a lot of people in the Biden administration that privately were very upset that they felt the American Jewish community was silent about Ben Gvir in the run up to the election. But I think a lot of people also felt this would play into Ben Gvir's hands, that he would say, I'm, a, I'm an underdog against an array of powerful people against me. So it, it might have boosted him. But now that the election is over, now Netanyahu has got to make the decision. These are the critical two weeks. I think if there's ever going to be uh, a time you know, to, to think about this, it's, it's going to be now. So we'll see. I, I just have to believe Bibi is not going to make him police minister. Sorry, can I just jump in, sure. just commenting on what you said and what you wrote uh, with sorry, yeah. the poem. Um, first, um, Netanyahu is unable to not be in a government with him because he has all of these judicial reforms plans and only Ben Gvir and Smotrich can help Netanyahu um, change the way that his trial is being conducted, change the attorney general, um, you know, replace her and so on, you know, things that, you know, will need, will require change of laws in Israel. So he's unable to perform any of this with Gantz and, um, and, uh, and Lapid or, you know, whoever. So this is not a possibility. It's not even, you know, to begin with, he will have to form a government. Now, Ben Gvir is going to be a very tough negotiator because without Ben Gvir, Netanyahu just doesn't have a government. So, and, and this, my second comment, I don't want you know, to take too much of other people's time, but the second comment is that Netanyahu has built his career in recent years about uncomforting the American administration, um, specifically the Democratic administration. Even in the last year, he stood up on the Knesset podium before this government was, was you know, um, dissolved. He stood on the podium in one of the speeches and he just, um, um, how do you say, um, it was um, full of confidence. He said it out loud that, uh, um, that um, he, he was uh, honored to be in a fight with Obama. That's his words, not mine. He said, you know, I was, you know, taking care of Israel. So the clashes with the democratic administrations were for him 
sort of a winning point or a or a um, you know achievement. So I mean, it's quite the opposite. He will want to have this confrontation. He will feel good about it. Sorry. <laughs> Can I just respond real fast? Look, when I wrote this thing with Dennis, I I you know I obviously said. Uh, this, you know, I said, look, anybody in Israel is going to read it, they're going to think we're out to lunch, because there's no way the whole thing is built on, on changing the, the legal system to insulate him from his trial. But I am very concerned about long term impacts and, and, and warning of consequences, I feel it plays into the hands of like a group that the MFI is very focused on, which are some of the progressives, uh, not all, I didn't say all the progressives, but some of them, that will use Ben Veer as their new poster child uh, to underscore their belief that Israel doesn't share their values. Uh, we've got a whole problem in this country of a younger generation of American Jews who are distancing themselves from Israel. This is gonna accelerate that. Um, there's, there's some real problems here. Even, I know in Israel, everyone thinks the Arabs don't care about the Palestinians or domestic governance because they themselves are not democratic. But what Abdullah bin Zayed said to Bibi, like, don't count on, you know, this isn't going to be very hard for us. And there, there, there are projects, I know the Israeli media isn't focused on it, but that the U.S. wants to advance on what's called the Negev Forum. I know you, the, the journalists know it, but some of our reader, viewers might not, of regional projects. I, I can't see the Negev Forum on water, on, on food technology, on, on environment. I mean... The media hasn't focused on this because the, the, the election is so overwhelming, but there's a lot of ripples here that are gonna come into effect and it shouldn't be assured that this government is gonna make it easier. I will say to Bibi's credit, I, and here I'm here, I will differ from Tal in a different way. I feel his relationship with Biden is very different than his relationship with Obama. That Biden and him, you know, Biden likes to say, I love you, BB, even if I don't agree with anything you say or something like that. He's used that a phrase many times. Uh, but yet yeah, Biden is not someone looking for a fight. He's someone who wants to solve things behind closed door. He's not going to get up at the, you know, as you know, both of you know, follow the State Department, doesn't get up at the podium every day complaining about things in, in the West Bank and settlements and stuff like that. So I do think that BB is not looking to pick a fight either with Biden because he knows that the alternative is much worse. And so I do think BB and Biden need to get along. Now, how they're going to navigate this, I don't know. I think the best hope is that somehow the, the, the Ben Veer dimension is contained in a way that is its personum Ben Veer, that it's not a problem with the state of Israel or the government of Israel, it's a Ben Veer problem. Uh, and because of all the convictions he's had, as, as Tal just pointed out, you know, that's going to be hard for, our, for, for the United States. So I think that's the best case scenario for U.S.-Israel relations, is that the U.S. basically boycotts Ben Gvir and tries to get on with business with the rest of the government. Uh, that, to me, seems like, from an Israel point of view, a huge achievement if that happens. Thanks, David. And I, I just want to uh, let our listeners know that Dim, if I did put out a statement about the Israeli elections yesterday, led by our board of co-chairs, Ann Lewis and Todd Richmond, we're going to throw that into the chat. And we, we touch on many of the issues that have been discussed on the call today. And Lahav, I would like to go to you uh, with the next question uh, from Jason. Uh, what are the long-term impacts of this election on the farther left parties, Moretz and Labor? And could you also let us know if you have any opinion about sort of the, the centrist parties and, and their future and if there's any lessons learned there. I, I see a lot of anger in the center and the left. And I think that there is, it is possible that there will be some sort of regrouping. I mean, this is the first time that Merit hasn't gotten into a Knesset since the party was established. Um, and they've been in danger of not getting into the Knesset for I don't know, the past decade or so. Like every, every election, it's like, is Merritt's going to get in? You know, um, and the people right now are actually really angry at the leader of labor, Meirav Bichaeli, because she was the one who really refused and said that she will not run together with Merritt's. Uh, Merritt's was more willing to consider it. Now, it's not so clear that 
the two parties running together would have been worth more than the sum of their parts. Um, and, and that was sort of Mirav Michaeli's argument that, you know, labor is a Zionist party, merits is sort of more mixed in that way. Um, but, but clearly, you know, they could have done it in a tactical way. They could have done what Israelis like to call a technical block, which is they run together in the election and then they break up once the new Knesset is sworn in. They could have done that. And people are angry about that on the left. And, and you know, we'll, we'll see if merits has if merits can survive this, if merits can come back in a few years. I, I do think that there is a place and there is a population in Israel um, that cares about, I mean, merits is very focused on, on social issues. I mean, they're very strong on the two-state solution while full withdrawal to 67 lines and everything. But, um, you know, they're, they're like the top party when it comes to, um, to gay rights, to environmental issues, to, I think, you know, labor and merits can compete right now when it comes to like women's issues, like not even just thinking that you would, that in the 21st century are considered feminist issues, but also women's like welfare issues of, you know, battered women's shelters and things like that. Like they, they are the leaders on, on all of these things. Um, and it's also part of why it's been a few years, but they used to be effective at actually passing laws from the opposition on these issues because because other people just weren't caring about them enough. But when when they brought it up, people would be like, "Oh, that's important," you know. Um, so I think maybe there there will be people who will realize that their sad merits is gone. But whether it's going to be a shared merits labor sort of configuration. Um, remains to be seen. I mean, I, I, it, it clear, it's clear numerically that they should have, they should have worked together. Um, labor, I think, is a really, it's a really interesting question because they, they were the party that led the country for its first 30 years and for a few governments after that, you know, on and off. And um, I think part of their problem was that they became a niche party, that they, in recent years, became a lot more like what I just described merits as being. I mean, the, the leader of labor right now is someone who's famous and she was famous before entering politics for being a radical feminist. And I, and I don't think necessarily people are like, no, I don't want this feminist woman. But I think that they felt like um, she was focused on things that were like a lot more sort of niche left-wing activist circle issues as opposed to the broader concerns of the country. And so people didn't feel like labor was this sort of big tent on the left the way it once was. Um, and when we talk about the centrist parties, Israel has a history of centrist parties popping up, doing quite well, and then disappearing. And um, if this is going to be a long lasting Netanyahu government, we might see that. We might um, it might follow the example of, of Shinui, which was Lapid's father's party, or of Kadima, that they like eventually imploded and then something new popped up that was very similar, but had a new name and a new leader. Um, on the other hand, Lapid definitely messed up that he didn't, people said, he, people in Hebrew have been saying he didn't manage the block, right? He didn't convince mid labor and marriage to run together, he didn't convince the Arabs to run together, but overall, He's really grown politically and, and in his political skill. And um, they've always been good at running really sharp, good campaigns in Yeshatid. Um, and so he might, he might be able to pull through. I, I, I just think that like, I mean, a lot of the party, right, is pulled through just on his own personal charisma, intelligence, et cetera. And so he might be able to use that again to survive where other centrist parties historically have not. Th thanks so much, Lahav. Uh, David, I, I know you have to go in a minute or so. I think you, yeah. have, you have a teaching engagement. Yeah. Can, do you have time for one more? Or yeah, of course. Okay. <laughs> it's, it, it, it's not going to be a short run, but I know you can answer yeah. it succinctly. Yeah. Can you talk to us about Israel's founding principles and its democracy? And has it been tested um, before? Yeah, excellent. Thank you for that question. And yeah, I do. I teach graduate students for now. 22 years at Johns Hopkins, that's called the SICE School, the School of Advanced International Studies. So I'm sorry you have to uh, go out. But I, um, look, I'd say don't sell Israel short. You know, this is an incredibly resilient country. They have uh, had 
you know, they, they haven't missed elections. They have wars, 48, 56, 67, 73, two intifadas, terrorism. And there's a certain resilience about the people and the greatness of Zionism is its commitment to institutions, in my view. And, um, you know, I was once sitting with Salam Fayyad, who was the prime minister of the Palestinians in Ramallah. He said, oh, David, I'm probably the only guy who reads Zionist history at night. There's no other Palestinian that does that. And I realized between 1917 and 1947, the Zionists built all these institutions. And so when they declared the state, they'd already built the state. And, and somehow, you know, with all the adversity, um, that commitment to institutions is something I don't think uh, Israelis are gonna give up on so soon, whether it's a, the judiciary um, or other democratic institutions. I, I have a certain faith in the people of Israel that have withstood adversity, that uh, its will to live is greater than its enemy's will to die. And this commitment to building institutions going back, we just celebrated yesterday, the 105th anniversary of the Balfour Declaration. That's what the Zionists did. And so somehow, you know, I, I somehow think that's still where the bulk of Israel is. Maybe not every party in Israel has those commitments, but I don't write the obituary for the Israeli legal system yet. Uh, I, I, I have faith in, in, in the resilience of a country that really it was hard fought, but they've built these institutions and I don't think they're gonna give up on them so fast. So I I'm, consider me still an optimist that everything, somehow, you know, there could be certain tweaks, uh, but I, I don't think people should bury the, the Israeli judicial system as, as, as losing its independence. Thank you so much, David. And it was, it was really a pleasure to have you and uh, we're grateful for your, your friendship uh, with DMFI. And I know I have uh, your book behind me. Oh, oh great. Well, wishing and, you guys a lot of um, success. You've got someone there who knows a lot about this election. We should probably <laughs> be doing his own, Mark Melman. He's the real, uh, when he's got a book to write, boy, and I'd love to hear his take. <laughs> But, uh, but thank you, Rachel, for inviting me. And again, my apologies. And it's an honor to be with Lahav and Tal. So thank you. Thanks, Thanks, David. All the best. Yeah. I'm going to try to fit in uh, maybe one or, one or two more questions. We have so many uh, from, our, from our group today. Uh, uh, Tal, I'd like to go to you on this. Uh, Howard asks, should we expect any change in attitude vis-a-vis -vis Russia and Ukraine, especially with uh, Iran uh, helping Russia? Yeah, wow, that's a big question. Um, I saw Israel uh, opposition leader in the American media about two to three weeks ago being asked about that. And he actually complimented the current government saying that they are taking the right route to, you know, um, assisting on humanitarian, the right route, I mean, which, which means they are assisting on humanitarian aid. They are not supplying weapons to the Ukraine. And they are watching themselves not to get into a direct fight with Putin. Uh, because as you all know, Putin has been uh, semi-sovereign you know, over uh, Israel's northern area, specifically on Syria. So um, Netanyahu was saying kind of uh, they're doing the right thing or something like that. Uh, obviously, Netanyahu comes to the plate with a rich history or personal uh, good relationship with Putin. This was one of his big, um, um, you know, stances in, in the campaigns, like about three years ago, uh, or yeah, three years ago, maybe in the first or second campaign, he said, you know, I'm, I'm um, the, the league, you know, I'm, I'm the uh, upper league uh, uh, leader because of my, and we had like billboards with uh, Netanyahu and Putin and Netanyahu and Trump all over the country. Uh, obviously things have changed. I don't think Netanyahu will want to be uh, seen in the same room with Putin at the moment. It's not a good uh, angle, but I don't think that he will confront him directly or he will say anything against him because this is not, um, you know, good for the country, for the northern part of the country. Um, when I say that uh, Putin is the sovereign over the northern part of the country, it means that Israel's airplanes are attacking targets, Iranian targets in Syria, and this is done on a delicate day-to-day -day cooperation with the uh, Russian military not to hurt or shoot any of the Israeli airplanes. Now, when the Iranians are the you know, suppliers of weapons such as they do right now, it changes a bit 
the issue, but I think um, mostly for Israel, it's a good way to um, stress the Iranians uh, harmful, um, uh, harmful uh, um, operations. Now, you know, it's easy to Israel now come up and say, you know, we told you the Iranians are really bad influence. Now see what they're doing to the Ukrainian people. So as long as you can get that um, um, recruited to the campaign against the JCPOA, and this is what they were doing, Bennett and Lapid. So it seems to me that Netanyahu will just continue with that. I don't see him in any way being to, you want to be chubby with, uh, with Putin, but I think also that he will not turn Israel's military uh, in a way to be assisting uh, Ukrainian military in any way. I don't see that in the cars at the moment. Thank you, Tal. Appreciate that. And and Lahav, I'm going to go to you for, for a last question uh, with just asking just for a brief response, and then we'll we'll invite on our our board co-chair Todd Richmond. Uh, I want to ask about the Abraham Accords. Clearly, the the Israeli government, in some in parts of leadership from the Biden administration, have made has made great strides uh, with some of its its Arab neighbors over the past couple of years. Do you think the inclusion of uh, Gavir Smotrich could could be a setback? For, for the Abraham Accords? And that's a question from David. Look, re reportedly, Abdullah bin Zayed, the foreign minister of the UAE, said that it will impact things. Um, I think it's sort of a, a, a wait and see. Um, I think it depends on what kind of position they have. Um, I don't think Smotrich is the issue. I mean, Smotrich, the thing is, He's not that far from Ben Gvir in terms of policy, but he does know how to sort of like conduct himself in an official government forum in a way that, uh, like I said, Ben Gvir is untested and we all have doubts. Um, and and nothing, nothing happened when Smotrich was minister. Like nobody, there were no boycotts. There were no, I mean, he was transportation minister, so it doesn't really involve that much international relations except for like the flight authority. Um, but I, I just, um, they ran together on the same list, but I wouldn't put them in the same category when it comes to these kinds of international issues. Um, yeah, so I, I think that it it has the potential to be harmful. I think it depends on what job Ben Gvir actually gets and what he actually does with it. Um, but I, I think that the Abraham Accords are important to Netanyahu and that he's going to really try to preserve them. Um, I think a lot of what the Biden administration has done is, is to encourage Israel to have better relations with Jordan and Egypt, actually, and this government has gone along with it and it's done really well for them. And sort of as Tal had mentioned before, especially with Jordan, Netanyahu has a pretty fraught history. Egypt is, is fine, I think. Egypt will continue to be fine. Um, but the, I expect to see tension there. And uh, and it's not only because of Ben Gvir, even if Ben Gvir wasn't there, um, Netanyahu was was tougher. <laughs> Jordan is the, the King Abdullah of Jordan. I mean, people see him as this, you know, really stabilizing figure in, in the Middle East. And to some extent, that's true. Um, but when it comes to Israel, he really, really like, he's just very populist, I would say, when it comes to Jordan. Um, and he makes really inflammatory statements about Israel and, and is sort of unmoving and sort of unwilling to it's unmoving when it comes to Jerusalem issues. And this government was sort of more willing to go along with it anyway, even though even it wasn't the King Abdullah himself, it was the Prime Minister of Jordan crossed the line at some point that even this government said, okay, you know, we understand we want to have a good friendship with you guys if there's a limit. Um, but Netanyahu is less tolerant of the sort of inflammatory things that, that King Abdullah has said and done about Israel. So that's, um, and Tal, of course, I've mentioned it before, but that's really something to keep an eye on, both on the Ben Gvir level and the Netanyahu level. Thank you so much, Lahav and, and Tal. I'm going to go ahead and bring on our board co-chairs. We know how busy you are, particularly this week, and we're really grateful that you've, you've taken an hour out of your schedules to join us. And we found your insights just incredibly helpful and clarifying for us Thank as well. You. Thank you. Thank you. thank you. Rachel, thank you. Wow, what a great job you did. You always do uh, such a fantastic job, so insightful. So, you know, on behalf of uh, Anne, uh, myself, uh, 
the board members that are on the call, thank you for you know all that you uh, do for us and uh, Mark Melman too. That was an incredible Zoom. I literally could have listened to everybody for another you know two hours or so, but of course we have uh, time constraints. Um, but please make sure you follow Laha the, at the Jerusalem Post and Tal at the um, Times of Israel and you know try and pick up David Makovsky's book, Be Strong and of Good Courage. Uh, really talks about the history uh, of, uh, of Israel's leaders. For those of you that uh, are members of DMFI, thank you for your support. For those that are not, uh, we would love to have your support. Uh, go to dmfi.org and you can sign up for updates. You can uh, donate to us as well. You can see here uh, on the Zoom right now, the link to go to. Uh, we are finishing up our campaign year so uh, anything that you could do to help us continue uh, the fight, uh, please do. And with that, we wanna say thank you uh, to everybody. Have a great afternoon and have a great rest of the week. Thank you.